It's not beavers building these dam like structures in the river before me. It's people. Several long wooden poles stick out of the water in a line, while three men use machinery that sounds like a jackhammer to pound the poles deeper into the creek bottom. Once the poles are all pounded in, another worker wades through the stream using a chainsaw to cut off the tops of the poles until only about three feet remain sticking out of the water. Then the crew starts filling in the gaps between the poles with tree branches and shovelfuls of dirt from the riverbank. It may seem hard to believe, but this unique innovative structure, which was actually conceptualized right here in Utah, is extremely effective at restoring the water level in rivers and at reducing erosion. This is Wild, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is episode 14, Artificial Beaver Dams. Welcome back to Wild. I got to come out on a fun little field trip today with some great folks. We are in Carbon County. Okay, I was about to say Emory County, somewhere near Price. <laughs> yep, we're right on the line of Carbon and Emory County, but we are in Carbon. There you go. Yep, we're sitting right next to a river. You can hear the little bubbling in the background. It's very picturesque here. Uh, so today I am out here checking out some habitat projects. I'm here with Nicole Nielsen. Kind of tell us really quick kind of what you do for the division, what your title is, and, and how long you've been with DWR. So I've been with DWR for about 11 years now, and I'm the habitat restoration biologist here in the southeastern part of Utah. Awesome. Nicole's kind of a big deal. She yeah. uh, oversees a lot of the uh, the restoration work, making lots of good feed for deer and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yep. Restoration for any kind of wildlife out there. Yeah. It's awesome. And then we also have Jordan Nielsen. No relation, although they were joking that they might be twins, which is funny if you could see them because they look nothing alike. <laughs> and I'm much less of a big deal. <laughs> no, whatever. Whatever, Jordan. <laughs> You're a big deal. So Jordan is actually, he's with Trout Unlimited. He used to work for DWR. So tell us, how long have you been at Trout Unlimited and, and kind of what you do for them? So I've been with Trout Unlimited for five years. I'm a project manager and I cover most of the Colorado River drainage in Utah. So anything that's related to cold water, protection, restoration, connect, reconnection of streams and rivers, that's what I do. I work awesome. On that stuff. And Trout Unlimited as a whole, kind of what, what is the organization? What do you guys do? So that's, that's kind of the, the mission. The mission is to protect, reconnect, and restore cold water fisheries in North America. Okay. So mostly we're focused on trout. My job is a little bit different because I focus on water flows, which keeps me working in other places that aren't necessarily trout specific all the time like this project here we hope we can get some trout here in the future but we don't have any trout yet sure so. and we do partner with you guys on a lot of stuff a lot you yeah. guys are great yeah so yeah you guys are playing a big role in this project as well so the the name of this project and the little stream that you can hear in the background is the miller creek project both of you guys kind of talk to us a little bit about what's the purpose of this project and basically why is it important so i guess maybe i'll go first on that this project started in 2016 i had a landowner come to me and ask what they could do to improve wildlife habitat on their property and we looked at you know all kinds of different treatments but one thing that we thought really could help improve this area is the restoring the stream to more of a, a natural vegetation community as well as more natural flow so that it's really important because it flows into the price river and we have, we have a lot of sediment coming down the stream from impacts upstream you know such as you know, fires aging plant communities you know just multitude of factors so yeah it's it's important because it flows into some drainages that are very important for wildlife and for our local communities Gotcha. And what kind of what are some of the things that we have done basically during this project? I know it, you said you started in 2016. It's been like a multi-phase, you know, several years long venture that we're on. So kind of walk us through what we started doing and kind of where we're at right now. Maybe we should start even a little bit earlier because in 2012 across 
the top of this watershed where all of this water comes down into the Price River, there was a big fire, the Sealy Fire. Oh, right, yeah. And so that burned a lot of the trees, most of the vegetation on the hillside. Right after that, there were heavy snowfalls and rainfalls, and so we had a lot of water come down. Like flooding. With, yeah, with a lot of energy, and so it was flood force energy, and it really destroyed the stream bed right where we're standing. It doesn't look too bad now because we've been working on it for a few years, but the stream bed had been cut down by the water three to four feet right here. And in some places up in the upper end of the watershed, it's more like 30 feet. It's like a little mini Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so really what is. a stream really needs for it to work really well is when that when those floods come down, it needs to be able to spread out so that energy doesn't destroy everything. It doesn't tear the banks down and it doesn't tear the vegetation out. And, and we, we call that excessive erosion. And, right. and so that's kind of the point. We needed to fix that because nothing was functioning right. Sure. We, didn't, we didn't have the right plants on the banks. You know, there were no willows or anything like that. The wildlife couldn't use it very well. And even the people grazing, like their animals couldn't get a drink of, of water because it was too far down. There, it's like 30 foot drop yeah. offs. They're yeah. having to yeah. rappel so, down in there. <laughs> so this particular landowner, he came to Nicole, like she said, and we started experimenting with, with some, some things and, and we saw that it worked. And so we started building more and more. The tool that we've used the most is called a beaver dam analog. And so that's science for a man-made beaver dam. Right. And so we put a couple hundred of those in Miller Creek between two landowners, and we're going to work on to a third landowner during this phase of the project. And what we see it doing is capturing all of that dirt that's eroding off of the, the mountain and off the banks that should be held in place. And it's lifting the stream bed back up so the water can spread out and then the, the right kind of plants can start growing again and protect the stream banks. Right. So that's kind of what is going on on this phase of the project. That's why I came down today is they're building some right now as we speak actually right and it's kind of interesting yeah nicole kind of describe what they look like for our listeners so they're kind of an interesting looking item so what we're doing is we have a three inch wooden post that has a pointed end and we use a hydraulic post pounder to drive these posts into the stream and we kind of stagger those posts so that we can then after those posts are driven in the stream weave willows or juniper boughs into them to kind of back up the water which then allows for the water to slow down and the sediment to fall out of the water which helps us then raise that stream bed back up. It so, forms like a little pool kind of. It's yeah. kind of cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. It forms a great so, pool and the, the pool also creates habitat. Right. The new ones form a pool, but we have some that we built in 2016 where there's no pool anymore. It's just a running stream bed. Gotcha. Yeah. We've, you see the we've top of the post. enough stuff that it's lifted the stream bed back up and now we have like nice vegetation on the banks and all you can see are the tops of the posts. Yeah, it like anyway. increases that all the way up, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that got us back to our floodplain, which is then allowing the vegetation to come back on the stream, which then the vegetation will hold all of the the dirt and that along that stream bed so that it doesn't just keep flowing down to the Price River. So it kind of just helps it all to stop carving so much and kind of just raise up and be usable. Exactly, again, right? exactly. And it's and I'm learning about all of this for the first time today. And like I said, we kind of walked down, did a little tour, and I was checking them out and watching them build them. And it is pretty impressive. Like you said, I mean, it really is, it's a man-made beaver dam. Like we're kind of filling that role of beavers, you know, <laughs> since they're not in this area. And, and it is kind of amazing to see like how kind of quickly it, it's helping repair this river. And one question I've been asked a lot on this project is, why not just let, you know, let beavers go in there and let them do the work? Sure. Well, you know, it's hard for people to see this, but there's not very much vegetation here. So there's, you know, beavers eat a lot of willows and cottonwoods. So there's there's just not much of that here. So a beaver would starve to death here. Right. There's so we really need to get the, the vegetation back before we could re release a beaver. And with installing some of these, I mean, obviously once the river's kind of repaired and it's more usable, there's more vegetation, I'm assuming more wildlife will kind of come back to this area once it's usable. And I think we're already seeing more. I mean, as I come down here, we see different bird species, more amphibians. So, you know, lizards and, you know, salamanders and that on site. Yeah, I just, I just feel like as we've worked on this project over the years, I am seeing more wildlife out here on this stream. Yeah, just today we saw a big flock of, of pinion jays while we were eating lunch. That They're not a super common bird species and... 
to see them right here on our project. That's kind of cool. It was cool. And there was a big flock of them. Yeah, I think that's probably the first time I've ever seen them, actually. Yeah. So and I was glad you pointed it out. Yeah. Right outside of the, the stream, we do have you know sagebrush as well as pinyon juniper habitat. So you would find a species like that, but the stream also will help create more vegetation diversity for species like that. Right. Talk a little bit about, you know, how how long typically does it take to install one of these BDAs? Each one, I guess, consists of just six to eight poles, roughly. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe even up to a dozen poles, depending on how wide the stream is. But I would say to do one, Jordan, help me help me here. We're probably an hour to two hours yeah, to do one from start to end. One of the things we realized early in this project that is that we would really benefit from hiring and training some contractors to do it. Sure. You know, for, for a couple of biologists to come out and do it, yeah, a couple of hours. But we've got some contractors that they bring a whole crew now, and they cruise. They're fast. They are. They, they, they'll build, you know, in a 12-hour in a day, they'll build 18 or 20 of them. That's amazing. Kind of with this project, what's kind of the goal? I mean, how many of these are you doing on this stretch of river? So early on in this, when it was just biologists out here doing this, we would spend three to four days and we would get six to eight put in. Okay. So <laughs> we, it, it was a lot of a lot of work. Well, now, and it's, and well, we it's were also of... learning and experimenting at the time, too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, we were learning ourselves. Once we started hiring a contractor and working with them and getting them to understand the concepts that we were, we were trying to achieve, I mean, in a week's time, 60 to 80 of them with a contract crew of, of five to six people. Wow. So yeah, we can we can get a lot in in kind of a short amount of time once we <laughs> once we understood how to do it. Sure. Yeah, last year in eight days they built almost ninety. That's yeah. amazing. They are just cranking them out. Well and it's I mean kinda of watching them, it's it's manual labor. Like it's physical hard work. Yeah. You know that, that post pounder that they use to put the three inch posts in weighs ninety pounds. That's crazy. So it takes a couple of them to lift it up overhead onto a six foot post. Right. And then drive it a couple of feet down into the riverbed. And riverbeds are rocky. They're hard. Yeah. And so those guys are hanging on that ninety pound post pounder and it's a basically a hydraulic jackhammer hanging onto that and pulling down as hard as they can to try and get those posts in the ground. Right. And even at times we still can't get posts in that spot and we'll have to, you know, change change where we're doing it or how we're doing it. And that's one of the things that we've learned through time is, you know, we use these beaver dam analogs as a as a tool, but we also use something else that we call PALS or a post assisted log structure. So we're putting logs across the stream and then we'll dig into the bank so that we can kind of key that that post in and then bury it and try to drive a few posts near it so that it doesn't come dislodged. So, you know, sometimes it's just too hard to get a post into the stream channel. So we've we've kind of found some other techniques to, you know, still achieve our goals. Up at the top two of the watershed where we were talking about, it had like 30 foot down cuts in the stream. We've used bigger structures where we took in some heavy equipment and we laid in rocks and logs that were big enough to, to actually capture a much larger amount of the erosion coming down. So it's not, it, we're not a one trick pony here. We're, <laughs> we're using whatever method we can for the, the spot that we, that we need to try and fix. Sure. And it is pretty, I mean, it is pretty innovative. Like it's, you know, like I said, I'd never really heard about it or knew much about how it worked until today. And it is, I mean, you guys are geniuses basically is what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't think you can give the credit to us. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, these were kind of developed out of uh, Utah That's State good. University Interesting. with a professor named Joe Wheaton. He's kind of developed these, we call them low-tech methods. You know, we're not going in with too much equipment or, you know, big rocks and logs. Most of the time it's just posts and whatever vegetation we can sure. cut shove from some, nearby. And shove some trees and some dirt in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so he, he has his own company that he consults on this, but he's willing to share his methods with everybody. And so we've gleaned what we could from some trainings and stuff from him. So this is really kind of a Utah product. That's awesome. That's but I, cool. I know they are being used all around the West. I mean, it's not just Utah. They're, they're being installed in Idaho and Oregon and, I mean, all around. So it is kind of catching on. It is becoming more of a you know mainstream technique you'd mentioned it's part of it is because it's just a lot more cost effective it's not as you know much material or yeah, labor. You, yeah you can just use materials from on site so the ones here we use juniper boughs 
So, you know, we have juniper right there, not too far from the stream. We'll cut those, you know, you, the green needles on them help catch the, the water and the sediment. You know, when they're green, they're really pliable so we can weave them between the post. So, yeah, we're using a lot of materials on site. The one thing that we do purchase is the post because we want them to be a certain size so they fit within that hydraulic post pounder so that they can be driven into the stream. Right. Uh-huh. So people might have a question as to why we are okay with cutting down trees. Well, those juniper trees are part of the problem here. Normally on a stream bank, we'd have willows and alders and cottonwoods and things like that. But in some of these places, the plant communities progress to the point where those junipers are coming in onto the banks. Junipers crowd out everything else. And so then we have dirt banks instead of banks covered by all that vegetation that should be there that's holding the banks in place. And then we end up with erosion problems. Sure. And so we cut those and, and it actually helps to cut them and move them back a little bit so that the good stuff can grow back in. That totally makes sense. I mean, and junipers have their place. They're good in places, but not on stream banks. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. And it's, it's a great use of materials that are on site that you can use that really work well. You're kind of using what you using what you got, you know, yeah. making it work. And so you kind of mentioned, you know, some of the benefits is decreasing erosion, you know, kind of helping repair, getting some healthier, different plant varieties in here. So talk about kind of who all benefits from these type of restoration projects. Because some people might think, well, you know, you're just doing this because you guys, you know, oversee hunting, you want bigger deer or you oversee fishing, you want people to come fish and spend money. But I mean, this, like you kind of mentioned, this actually benefits a lot of different people. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the communities downstream benefit a ton from this. I mean, when we have too much sediment into the streams, it really changes the water quality. And so that can have really big impacts on downstream users for you know, farmers and ranchers to municipalities and their water supply. So yeah, I would say that downstream for just the communities is maybe one of the biggest benefits of these type of projects. I mean, gotcha. Jordan, you work a lot on that. Yeah. So the, the water quality in the Price River is listed as impaired by the EPA. Oh no. <laughs> and it's because of this kind of stuff. Like the soils here have a lot of salt in them. Hmm. And so when they erode and Miller Creek carries that down to the Price River, the Price River becomes too salty and it becomes an impaired watershed. And farmers don't really want to use really salty water on their crops. It doesn't work as good as, you know, good, fresh, clean sure. water. So trapping all of that stuff with a BDA helps clean that up and they get fresher, cleaner water downstream. Interesting. Which is good for the fish that are in the stream as well. I mean, fish like a little bit of salt, but not a lot. Sure. And at least freshwater fish. Sure. (laughs) And uh, so we've got, you know, sensitive species in the Price River that can benefit from it, from better, cleaner water. There's Colorado River endangered fish species that occasionally use the Price River that are, that really benefit. We're hoping, and we think we're ready to, to put some trout right here on this property because we're higher up in the watershed. We think it stays cold enough that we could keep some trout here. Gotcha. And the, and the river's been repaired enough that it's like at a good enough level that it can keep fish alive. Yeah, I don't thing. think it's going to support a really big population. Sure. But but I think we can get them back in here. That's awesome. We have some pools and it stays cool enough and there's enough bugs for the, for the trout to eat and the landowners are willing. And the landowners are considering, you know, once we have fish in here to open open this up to walk in access to allow the public to come in here and, and fish. Sure. So, you know, that is part of the, yep. the bigger plan. And so we'd put the native trout here if we were able to do that, which maybe a year or two in the future, if we're able to, we'd put the native trout in here, which is Colorado River cutthroat. And I think that would be awesome. That mm-hmm. that fits Trout Unlimited <laughs> mission really well. Sure. So. <laughs> right. right. And from my perspective, I mean, because I am a habitat biologist, not a fish biologist, I just want to see fish in here. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate goal for me is can we repair this enough that we can we can see wildlife back here, sure. especially fish. You're sustaining so, life again, right? Yeah. Both of our organizations are traditionally hunting and fishing organizations. And so obviously we're going to gravitate to the hunting and fishing aspect sure. of this. But more and more people are non-consumptive users of wildlife. And like we just talked about the pinion jays. You've put quail in here. Uh, yeah. They're, We've also released uh, turkey in here. Turkeys, which are, you know, the quail and the turkeys are things that could be hunted but still something that people like to come out and see. Sure. And And I mean, like we talked about, you know, pinion jays, they're just tiny little birds. You're not going to 
necessarily hunt them or whatever, but it's cool to see, you know, it's always cool to see wildlife, you know, even if you're not. And I would say this is crucial winter range. So we're, we're really close to like a main paved road that you and I drove up on. And a lot of the community comes out on the weekends and, you know, they, they want to view the wildlife in this area, you know, especially in the winter when there's not much to do. So by improving conditions here on the stream, we really are having a benefit for big game, which, you know, our, our public is viewing. Yeah. That's a non-consumptive item. Yeah, so we've actually talked a lot about the stream work that we're doing. Yeah. But this tr- project is a whole lot bigger than just the stream work. We've been right. doing a lot of work in the uplands, trying to create a mosaic of vegetation, you know, taking out the pinions and junipers that are overgrowing, putting in good vegetation that can be grazed by, like by ranchers. farmers and ranchers, yeah. but also be used by wildlife. And it creates those edges that a lot of wildlife really like to use, the edge between the trees and a more meadowy, sure. grassy type of stuff. A lot of wildlife uses that. So there's tons and tons of benefits to Yeah, and this this really is a watershed project. It's not just a stream project. You know, we've done work, you know, outside of the stream. And a lot of the work that we're doing outside of the stream actually can have benefits for in stream. Sure. So by doing work outside of the stream, you know, we're reducing erosion from outside of the stream that could potentially end up there. So, yeah, we're looking at this as a whole, not just one piece at a time. Sure. It's the bigger picture. And kind of walk us through what some of the other phases of this project have been. Like you said, today we've kind of been talking more about these little artificial beaver dam aspect of it because they're cool. But, yeah, talk about, like, how do we do some of the other work? What have been some of the other phases? So some of the other phases of we've worked on pinion and juniper that have kind of moved into more of a sagebrush community. So we've used uh, chainsaw crews to come in and cut that out if we still have a really good plant community there and it, you know, the pinion and juniper are very sparse. Then there's other areas where we've done a bull hog, which is basically using heavy equipment with a special attachment that mulches these trees down. And a lot of times we do that when there's not much growing underneath the trees. So we'll put together a seed mix that has grasses and wildflowers and maybe some other shrubs. And we fly that on ahead at a time and then we bring in the bull hogs and as they're working through that area mulching the trees it works that seed into the ground and then we have you know a really good vegetation community coming back afterwards and and not too far from here you know we've it was really pretty this summer we had a lot of the wildflowers coming in yeah. and a cool. lot of sunflowers and you know it was kind of visually nice to see yeah, yeah. bee plant there's a lot of bee plant in it which is a good species for for birds. Things, things that use pollen, so birds and, and insects. And yeah. it's just, you can see these fields of like purple. That's awesome. And they're really cool looking. That's awesome. And the mulch, like from the trees, kind of works as like a fertilizer too, doesn't it? So what it does is it kind of creates a microsite so it can hold more moisture. Okay. And, you know, as it kind of shades and creates a, a micro habitat for, for moisture to hold. So it allows our seed to grow a little bit better. See, once again, it's just like putting a good mulch cover in your yard. Sure. You know, over your flowers, it helps, you know, hold water there and makes it, makes it a little bit healthier yeah. soil. And sometimes even the tracks from the equipment, if you have metal tracked equipment, it leaves the, the marks grooves, in the yeah. soil. Yeah, the grooves. And that also is a microsite because the water runs into it. And that's a good place to get these plants established. And once those mm-hmm. plants are established, they seed out and it just, you know, kind of grows from there. And then the entire area pretty soon is covered in grasses and wildflowers. Sure. It all benefits and kind of works together. Yeah. 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 Well, a common underlying theme here is water right <laughs> right so we we are working in the desert most of utah is the desert so right. anything that we can do that conserves and creates water on the habitat whether it's in the stream or on the upland it's just going to make everything flourish sure and and kind of what's the overall timeline for this project to be completed you know i, I get like i said this is kind of the third phase i guess of this multi-year project so what else do you guys have planned after this i think right here in miller creek itself we're we're probably done for a few years but we are going to move on to some other tributaries to the price river and start working on those and one of those is called second water which is on one of the divisional wildlife's wildlife management areas and so i hope to see that stream be improved to the point where we have great you know stream fishing for the public 
That's awesome. You might be done in Miller Creek for a couple of years. <laughs> I've still got a lot of work to do <laughs> because that I'm working with some of the water users to try and make sure that we have enough water in the stream that it makes it all the way to the Price River all year long. I see. There are sections of it that dry up. Plus, the further down you get, once you get into the, the ag land, there's some real fire risk because there's a lot of uh, Russian olive and tamarisk that, is, that are on the stream banks. Mm. And so we've got some, we're, we're working on some plans on dealing with that. They're kind of coming together, not fully together yet. But when I when we work with the ag community, we can work on some kind of different facets of this like gotcha like making sure that we have enough water for them to farm but also enough water to keep the stream healthy because if they have a healthy stream running through their farm their farm is going to be healthier sure. so it benefits them as well yep and then it, and it just continues to improve that water quality all the way down right well and kind of you've kind of perfectly segued into this talking about this project you know who are the the partners on this and how is this type of work funded because I mean, while these, some of these, you know, we're using trees and other things, it's still expensive. You know, there's a lot of labor that goes into it. There's equipment and things. So, so yeah, kind of talk about the partnerships and, and the funding for these type of habitat things. So uh, one of our biggest funding sources is Utah's Watershed Restoration Initiative, but that really is kind of a, a collection of other funding sources. So we've had, you know, National Wild Turkey Federation fund this. We've had Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife, Mule Deer Foundation. We've we've had some, you know, other agencies that we've worked with that have helped. You know, they they've had other parts of this project, and so we've collaborated with the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. We're working with industry like Conoco Phillips, who's financially contributed quite a bit to this project because as we drove in, Faith, you noticed some of the, the pump jacks. We are in an active gas field. Right. So that's Conoco Phillips. They're working here. And so they, they want to work with us to make sure that this area is benefited for wildlife, for their employees, and for the community that right. they, they work in. So Jordan, who am I missing? <laughs> Did you say Fish and Wildlife Service? Yeah, so we've worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. Mm-hmm. We have our good friend Clint Wyrick who comes out and helps. Yeah. And he's he's pretty much a genius when it comes to the right plants to put in. Oh, yeah. wow. So. And, and we're working with, you know, NGOs, so non-government organizations like Wild Utah Project. Who else? Trout Unlimited. Yeah, I guess I guess we're working with Trout you Unlimited. Guys, we'll we'll count you guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I I think it is cool though just looking at, you know, cuz these are massive projects and a lot of times it's a huge area and there's a lot of things that you guys are doing and so it's been cool to me to see how important these partnerships are cuz we kind of talked before Nicole about how, you know, a lot of this we it couldn't be funded if it was just state dollars basically yeah. running it. So it's it's really helpful to have all of these different partnerships and to see like we'd mentioned how so many different people benefit from this yeah i mean part of what's being funding this project is the sale of licenses and tags but that alone couldn't fund all of this so yeah we really have to combine all of our dollars and kind of like many hands make light work right many funding sources make these projects happen so yeah we couldn't do it without our partners yeah well, we have to give credit to the landowners as well because everywhere sure. we've worked on this particular creek so far has been private land wow so we have three private landowners that have been willing to let us come in and work on their property which a lot of private landowners don't want a government agency sure. working, working on their property and it's also allowed us this to be a showcase so that we can show other landowners or other agencies you know w- how these bdas work so this has also become our showcase that we bring people to and show them it, it really does work. Out here. <laughs> yeah, that's we bring awesome. a lot of people out here to show it off. Well, and how long does it usually take from installation of these till you do kind of see a difference and you see the the river rising and, well, and it, plants you'll, you'll going see back. you'll see the river come up immediately. Okay. Um, which is a cool thing for the farming and ag community and and everywhere as well because it raises the water table. Sure. It makes their water last longer in the summer, so it doesn't all just flush out in the spring. It filters back into the soils and then comes back in to the stream later in the year as the river comes down. It's a little bit like a sponge. Yep. It'll soak up a bunch of that water, and then as it dries out, you know, it's like wringing that sponge, and it kind of comes back out slowly so yeah. that you get this sustained flow. So the first the first BDAs we put in in 2016, we had no idea what would happen. We put them in in March, 
we came back in August and they were completely full of sediment. They'd That's lifted amazing. up three or four feet. So that was just a couple of months. And the river was like already going over the tops mm-hmm. of them. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. mean, within a matter of weeks. It was awesome. <laughs> it really was. I mean, I tell this story a lot, but we put in the, the BDAs in 2016 and I was driving somewhere about a week later and we'd had a really big rainstorm and I could just see the floodwaters crossing where this water crosses the highway. And I was like, oh, no, all of our hard work's gone. It's all Washed it's out. all downstream. And I, I wouldn't come up here for a little bit to look at it because I just didn't want to see all of our hard work gone. And <laughs> you were preemptively in mourning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and so I finally got brave and came up here. And they'd already filled with about a quarter of sediment. Like they had already caught and done what they were supposed to. And I was like, oh, my gosh, these really do work. That's amazing. So, cool. yeah, it was, it was a little nerve-wracking, but I'm glad I finally did come back up. <laughs> yeah. And for for both of you guys, I mean, you, you kind of touched on that, but what would you say has been the most beneficial thing or exciting thing for you personally in working on this, this big project? For me, it's watching it develop from Utah Division of Wildlife and Trout Unlimited. They, they were already going to do this. You just stole my answer. I don't care. <laughs> they were already going to do this. They invited me out to work with them because I was pretty new to working in in the price area at that time and then watch it just grow to fish and wildlife service and we've had utah um, grazing improvement program yeah grazing improvement program more landowners more more partners turkey federation and wild utah project and at the funding grow for what three years in a row we've had the highest scoring project with WRI, one of the highest scoring projects in the state. Wow. You get so, you get a lot of points for collaborating, taking things across, you know, jurisdictional boundaries or bringing in more partners. And this project just kind of did it on its own. And wow. yeah, we've really done well scoring within that system. That's that makes it easy cool. to fund it. And it makes it, I, I think the, the impacts are really broad. Sure. So, so that, I think for both of us, that's the most exciting thing. That's awesome. Yeah, and I and think that's... The day, some... the day we put fish in here, that'll be pretty exciting. <laughs> that will be pretty <laughs> that, exciting. That'll jump to uh, the top of your list. <laughs> maybe. Maybe <laughs> maybe we'll be putting fish in and I'll be dabbling a fly rod at the same time. <laughs> Jordan is a pretty spectacular fisherman. I've been out with him a few times and anytime he puts a lure in the water, he's... He's get, pretty spectacular. He something. brings something out. Yeah. That's awesome. That's super cool. Well, I appreciate you guys taking a minute to kind of, you know, explain to our listeners a little about this project and just some of the benefits of these this type of habitat work. I think it's super important and some of the most important work that we do as, a, as an agency at DWR. So hopefully everyone has found this beneficial and learned a lot like I have today. And as always, if you haven't subscribed yet to the Wild Podcast, we'd love you to do that. You can find us anywhere that you listen to podcasts. We release a new episode on the third Tuesday of each month, and we hope that you'll join us next month for some more wildlife stories. Mm-hmm.